So have you found Acts chapter 13 yet? We encourage you to, to scroll there or to open your Bibles to, to do that. And what we're going to do, we are not going to read the entirety of Acts chapter 13 here this morning. But I do like giving homework. So if you're hearing my voice right now, I encourage you to read Acts chapter 13 at some point during your prayer and study time this week. You're going to pick up on a whole lot of things that we just simply don't have time for here this morning. doesn't mean it's not important, but there's little details and little nuggets in there that are really, really good. So where Coach left off last time was the end of Acts chapter 12, which is where the word of God has spread to the Gentiles. It is beginning to spread over all of Israel right now and beyond. And we saw that the church at Antioch in Syria, which is just north of Israel, was planted. And now that church is beginning to flourish. And one of the things, one of the key takeaway points that, that Coach talked about last week is the church was in constant prayer. And we see the miraculous happening. That should be a lesson to us that prayer is important, not just for us as individuals, but for the church body. And, and I am so thankful to be a part of a praying church body. We have a lot of people who pray at this church. Collectively, they pray for the people in this congregation. It is just, it's wonderful to see. So as we look at Acts chapter 13, we're going to break this down into three easily digestible points that we can look at and say, okay, here's what God was doing, but also how does this apply to my life? Because again, America in 2022, it's all about me, right? We're always like that, but we're going to see what we can glean from this. What can I walk away with in looking at this account? So the first point that we're going to look at is nepotism and second chances. Now, in Acts chapter 12, what we talked about last week was you had a prayer meeting happening there in Jerusalem. And remember, the angel freed Peter from prison and took him, and he knocked on the door of, it was a woman named Mary's house. She was hosting this prayer meeting. Well, she had a son named John Mark. John Mark is who we're talking about here today. So at the beginning of Acts chapter 13, we have the, let's call them the elders there at this church at Antioch in Syria. We're going to be talking about another Antioch here in just a little bit. But the Holy Spirit, as they were praying, they said, I want you, the Holy Spirit said, send out Paul and Barnabas. I've got a mission for them. So being obedient, what they did was the elders laid hands on them and sent them out. So this begins what we know as Paul's first missionary journey. He's eventually going to take three, but this is the first one. So we have this man named Paul, but we also have Barnabas. Barnabas says, hey, I've got a cousin who would be great to help us in this, these travels. On this first missionary journey, let's bring my cousin. His name is John Mark. And so what they do is they go out and they begin this first missionary journey. Now, here's what I want us to, to look at. And I, again, I encourage you to read Acts chapter 13 so you get kind of the full depth of what we're talking about. But it's important to understand the Holy Spirit set apart Barnabas and Paul for this missionary journey. John Mark was not necessarily, necessarily sent by the Holy Spirit. He was there as an assistant. Does that mean he wasn't important? Not at all. But we're going to see the difference between the, the Spirit empowering someone to do something versus not. So let's pick this up in Acts chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 4. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5. It says, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed to the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. 
John Mark went with them as their assistant. So there we see kind of the, this cast of characters. They are there on this first mission, mission, missionary journey. I knew Tom was going to say something. But we have them showing up, and they are preaching the word of God in the synagogues. They are preaching to the Jews first. More on that here in just a minute. But let's jump down to Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 13. We're going to look at 13 and 14. It says, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing in the port town of Perga. Watch this. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. Now, at first glance, okay, he just, he said, okay, I'm going back to Jerusalem. And then we go on to the next verse. But when we study the Bible, we know that there is more to that where it says that John Mark just left and went back to Jerusalem. That verse right there causes a huge strain on Paul and Barnabas' relationship. Again, Barnabas, this was his cousin. According to Colossians chapter 4, John Mark was Barnabas' cousin, so of course he's going to be protective of him. And nepotism means you hire family members that they get preferential treatment over other people. So I want you to look, and we have it up here on the screen. This is Acts chapter 15. So this is down the line a little bit. This is when Paul was about to go out on his second missionary journey. I want you to watch John Mark, that assistant, that, that helper that they had, causes this rift right here. It says, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. That is the heart of a shepherd right there. Going back and checking on the people, not just, hey, you guys are good. All right, we'll see you later. Nope. What they would do is the missionary journeys, they would go out, do, 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 do. Then they would come back, do, 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 do. Come back for the second missionary journey, brrr, even further, and then come back. And then the same with the third missionary journey, that there was a shepherding relationship there. Verse 37, Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along his cousin John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had what? Deserted them. Deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with them and sailed to Cyprus. That's the original, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. That's exactly what happened right there. Now, why is this important? to our story. Paul and Barnabas were sent, commissioned by the Holy Spirit. John Mark was not. He was there to help out probably the absolute best intentions in the world, but he got mad and he quit. What we call that today is our flesh took over, presumably, presumably. Now, what ended up happening to John Mark? We see him right here He's a quitter there in verse 38. He just quit and went home, went with his cousin. He deserted them, but he also, in 2 Timothy, says that eventually he found forgiveness from Paul. The one who disagreed strongly, the one that Paul knew as the quitter, John Mark eventually found grace in the eyes of Paul. John Mark also dictated, when Peter was in prison, dictated what Peter, his travels and, and things like that. That later became known as, under divine inspiration, the gospel according to Mark. Same guy. This quitter wrote one of the four Gospels 
again, under divine inspiration. So we know all of this. Okay, we get that he's a quitter. He, you know, took his ball. He went home. He was mad. He pouted, whatever. But he also found restoration, not just in the eyes of Paul, not just in the eyes of Peter, but more importantly, in the eyes of the Lord. Every Christian deserves a seat on the bus. You may not be in the right seat during this season. Doesn't mean that you don't belong on the bus. You may say, you know what, I, the Lord is calling me to go be a missionary. I'm going to go be a missionary assistant. You get there and you're like, oh, this was not the Lord. So you quit and go home. Is that the end of your Christian service? No. Because if, if you follow what John Mark did, the Lord may have this for you over here. And you keep trying to do this over here. See, that's why it's so important in this account, in Acts chapter 13, that the Holy Spirit sent Paul and sent Barnabas. Was John Mark sent by the Holy Spirit? We don't know. The fact that he would quit and go home, mm, throws some red flags at least. John Mark found restoration, and the Lord used him in a big way when he was ready. Who's the he? Was it John Mark? Nope. When the Lord was ready for John Mark, he said, I've got great things for you, but this isn't it. Hold tight. You're going to do some awesome things. And we see that in the third gospel. You may be in a time of preparation right now for what is coming next. Like it says in the New Testament, do not grow weary in doing good. You may be thinking, okay, well, this is, this is great, but, you know, the Lord is calling me to this great thing. That's awesome. If you're like me, I didn't enter ministry until I was mid-30s, late-30s. I had to wait for almost a decade before it happened. Why? I wasn't ready. And the Lord knew it. The Lord knew that I was not ready yet. Me and my impatience was like, oh, let's go. Let's, let's do this thing. Let's, you know, and it's like, uh, the Lord, mm, stop. Take a breath. I will call you when I'm ready. If you are in that waiting period, I know, like Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. Some of you guys giggled at that. Preparation. Everything is preparation for what is coming next. But I will say this. A willing heart goes a long way in serving the Lord. A willing heart. It may be, Lord, I want to do this in ministry. I want to be the one singing up here under the spotlight. No offense, John. I want to be that person up there. And God's saying, no, no. I want you serving back there in the sound booth for two years. It's preparation, understanding, notes, melodies, chord progressions, all of that. And I'm talking gobbledygook, I know. But it may be preparation for what's coming next. So what can we understand from this account right here? A willing heart goes a long way in serving the Lord. Be patient. The Lord is not through with you yet. So our first point was nepotism and second chances and we saw that in the account of John Mark our second point we're going to talk about true God the true God and counterfeits so as we continue through Acts chapter 13 I'm, I'm going to paraphrase we, we have the slides but I'm just for the sake of time I'm going to paraphrase this what happens is Paul and Barnabas they are going around there preaching on this island, the island of Cyprus. And what they do is they come across a Jewish sorcerer. A what? A Jewish sorcerer. His name was Bar Jesus. Like, what does that mean? Jesus at the bar? No. Bar means the son of Jesus. Not, not our Jesus, but the name Jesus. But there was also a guy 
who was in charge. He was part of the, the Roman uh, governing body. He was actually the governor. And Paul and Barnabas show up and start preaching to him. And he's like, okay, well, I'll listen to what you guys have to say. But this Jewish sorcerer, his name was also Elymas, he interfered and was like, no, 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 don't, don't listen to these guys. Don't listen to what they're preaching, which is the true Christ. Do we have verse 9? Can we go to the next one? Acts 13, 9. Watch Paul's reaction. Saul, also known as Paul, which, by the way, he didn't change his name. Paul was his... Saul was his Hebrew name, Paul was his Greek name, so he's going to be referred to as Paul from here on out, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye, then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, the enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, you will be struck blind, you will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began uh, groping and begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the miracle that the Lord did. No. What does that say? The teaching about the Lord. As we see in the book of Acts, as we continue through this, these signs authenticate the message that was being preached. Miracles attract a crowd. Miracles do not save anyone. The Lord, the Word, the Holy Spirit are the, the ingredients that take place, but ultimately the Holy Spirit that saves people. So when he sees this miracle, his crony, his stooge, this sorcerer who was trying to prevent him from hearing the gospel message sees this mist come around his eyes he's like okay these guys are the real deal because of the message that he heard that's what saved him Sergio Paulus was his name he put his trust in the Lord now here's an interesting little tidbit anytime someone tries to prove the Bible wrong in any kind of way, there's always evidence that pops up that proves the Bible to be right. And you may be thinking, okay, that's kind of a strange place to bring this up. On the island of Cyprus, about 20, 30 years ago, they were going through, they found some, some like catacombs and, and aqueducts underneath the, the land there. And they started going through, and they found in one of the tunnels saying... At this time, there was a governor who was part of the, the governing body at the time, and it said, almost like a, like a commemorative plaque, you guys have seen those on the wall, that you know, this building was dedicated on such and such date, that it was around this exact time, which is about 30 to 40 years after Christ, where it said, during this time, under the the guise or under the leadership of Sergio Paulus was this aqueduct uh, dedicated. So in other words, this happened at the same exact time that Luke, our author, our human author, said that this happened. Again, Luke was a historian. He knew certain dates and things like that. And so when you see something like that, it's really, really interesting. Okay, so here we have this counterfeit, this bar Jesus, this Elymas, this Jewish sorcerer trying to stop Sergio Paulus, the governor, from hearing the truth about Christ. Now, he was a counterfeit. And just by looking at verses 9 through 12, Nate, if we can go ahead and pull those up real quick. I want you to look because the, the text itself tells us how counterfeits operate. Number one, they operate in deceit and fraud. Look at verse 10. You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud. They're an enemy of all that is good. They pervert 
the true ways of the Lord. They pervert. They take that message that is true and twist it into something else. Sometimes counterfeits are very hard to distinguish. Has anybody ever worked in a bank or currently work in a bank? A couple of people, yeah. Sometimes, they, remember they came out with those counterfeit pens? You can just mark on it and it'll like, turn brown. I don't know, whatever. I'm not a banker. But it will show that it, if it is true or not, if it's the actual money. But it's side-by-side. Printers are so good nowadays, it's hard to tell side-by-side what is true and what is false. But if you are a counterfeiter, pretend you're a criminal at church, um, if you are going to go out and counterfeit, would you counterfeit something, would you print like an $8 bill? No. You're like, okay, get this goober out of here. No. You would try to counterfeit the highest denomination possible. You can't do a $1,000 bill, that would draw too many flags. I think they had a $10,000 bill was that at one point. Uh, but you would do ones, fives, tens, twenties, maybe a 50 if you're feeling saucy. But what you want to do is you want to counterfeit because that would draw the least amount of attention. But the point is they are hard to distinguish sometimes between the authentic. Now, why are we talking about this in church? They interview, they interfere with the truth of God's word. So to put this into our perspective, it may look like a duck, may walk like a duck, may quack like a duck, but it's really a duck-billed platypus or something. Not a duck. Same kind of thing. But Jesus said this, you will know them by their fruits in reference to false teachers. These phonies, these counterfeits, you will know them by their fruits. So if you turn on any TV station, you see some preacher up there, you know, saying all this kind of stuff, and it sounds really good, sounds kind of Christian-y and all that kind of stuff, you will know them by their fruits. There are counterfeits out there. Their intention is to lead people astray. In Acts chapter 20, when we get there, Paul warned the elders at the church at Ephesus, watch out, people from among you elders are going to rise up. They are going to try to draw away disciples after themselves. They are counterfeits. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. If people in leadership or who profess to speak the things of Christ If they are pointing you towards themselves and not the word of God, red flag, red flag. Be aware that there are counterfeits out there. They look good. They may have a book. They may have, you know, a tape series or whatever. There are counterfeits out there. And another thing to, to walk away, just to kind of wrap up this last point, the power of God overtook the power of the enemy that day. Paul looked him square in the eye and said, you son of the devil, you're perverting. And then he goes on to to say, he knew it. He called him out exactly where he stood. The power of God. Paul, under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, this dude is a fraud. Call him out on it. Okay, so our first point was nepotism and second chances. Our second point was true God and counterfeits. The third point, and if you get nothing else today, get this point. The reliance on grace. So what Paul does is he is continuing to go to these synagogues. He is preaching to the Jews first. When they reject it, he's going to preach it to the Gentiles This is Antioch of Pisidia, so a different Antioch from where we started in the first couple of verses. This is actually in modern day, kind of on the 
Turkey, Greece border, kind of up in that area. It's inland a, a little while. But you have Jews out there. And Acts chapter 13, verse 16 says, So Paul stood and lifted his hand to quiet them and started speaking, Men of Israel, again, talking to the Jews, and you God-fearing Gentiles, those who had shown up, listen to me. And then what happens is, has anybody ever read the Cliff Notes? Be honest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does not surprise me, Dylan. Cliff Notes is, if you don't want to read Great Expectations, which is like that, you buy the Cliff Notes version. It gives you the summary, the plot, the book, everything you need to write your paper. Right, Dylan? Uh, everything you, knew, you need, it has it. It's in a very, very short form. If you, and I'm not encouraging this, if you don't have time to read the Old Testament, read Acts chapter 13 where Paul goes, and basically what he does is he does a flyover of the Old Testament. He hits kind of the key points, boom, 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 boom. But what he's doing is he is preaching Christ. He is using the Old Testament to make the case that Jesus is the Christ. We saw that several times already in the book of Acts. We saw them saying, making the case that Jesus is the Messiah. But I want to drop down to Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 38. So Acts 13, 38, Paul wraps it up by saying this, Brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's, say, in, in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. That's a very powerful statement, but he goes on. Verse 42 as Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, which that in itself is amazing. These Jews saw the pieces kind of put together. They're like, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. And so they followed Paul and Barnabas. But watch this. Again, if you get nothing else today, look at verse 43. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Barnabas. And the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. This, this verse, I've read it many, many times. This jumped out at me and it stuck with me all week urge them to continue to rely on the grace of God. Do we do that? Do we urge others to continue in the grace of God? How do we do that? We understand the Bible by faith, not by fact, not necessarily by logic and reason. When we see something like the inscription on the wall of this aqueduct that says Sergio Paulus was here A.D. 52, that's cool. That reiterates what it is that we believe, but we get to the Bible by faith. Not by, well, if all the archaeology lines up, then I will go ahead and understand it and believe it. We don't get there by logic and reason, which does not make sense, pun intended. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those aren't my words. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We get there by faith. So when we continue to rely on the grace of God, what does that say to us? Grace is often associated with love and compassion. Grace is that unmerited favor, meaning you didn't do anything to earn it. That grace was extended 
to each of us in the form of Jesus Christ. So here in verse 43, Paul and Barnabas urge them to continue to rely on that love of God, to rely on that compassion of God, that that message of Christ. That is, what we should do is rely on, on that grace in everything that we do. Keep that in mind when you're cutting people off on the highway out here trying to get away from church. Continue to rely on the grace of God. That way when somebody cuts you off, you can say, God bless you, have a great day. That type of thing. But it is continue to rely on the grace of God. That word reliance is... Something that just continually comes up here in this pulpit. Not just by me, not just by Tom or Eric or Nate. It is in the word of God itself. We are to rely on him, not just for salvation. Like what Tom was saying over here when, when Eddie was being baptized, that it's, it's not just about salvation. It is every morning waking up and continuing to rely on, on that grace of God. It's exactly what you guys talked about. Relying on that grace. That takes the burden off of us. We aren't the ones doing grace. It is God who extended that grace. Our job is just to cling to Christ, to need him. Not just the good days, not just the bad days, not just the tough times or the happy times or any every single time. That's what reliance means. It means apart from you, I can't do it. If I start trying to rely on myself, who's it? Uh, Thomas Aquinas, self-reliance? Anybody? No, I just made that up. One of those writers from way back when, the 1800s, had a book called Self-Reliance. That's not what this is talking about. Our reliance should be on the Lord himself. Again, not just the good times, but the bad times as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And Father, we just want to pause for a second and really meditate on this line. Lord, we want to continue to rely on your grace. It's not in our actions that we get more grace or when we do dumb stuff that you take away your grace. Father, you have extended that grace to us in the form of Jesus Christ, that love and compassion because you loved us so much that you sent him to die on our behalf. That was your grace extended. And Father, it is our job to respond to that by faith, but also to continue to rely on your grace. And Lord, I ask that you help us to do that, especially this week. That we pause and we reflect and we bring to remembrance this verse. That when someone does something to us that irritates us, that we can rely on your grace and extend grace to others. But also we have a love for people, those who have not come to faith in Christ. I ask that you help us this week to extend that grace, to love them enough to share the message of the cross with them, that it is not our works. It is not our goodness that puts us in your good grace. It is your work of sending your son. And Father, I just ask that you help us to articulate that to others, that we show love and compassion to others so that you get the glory because you are worthy of it. Father, we thank you for this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.